like relationship between the root note and the song. You see what I mean? He has no musical ear, but he has a kind of good vibey ear, and he's a very amiable fellow, and you, you put you in a great mood, and you want to work for him. And somebody like Todd Rundgren, who has an incredible musical ear, and can go away overnight and knock up one or two brass arrangements or whatever and come back in the next morning, and there they are, perfect. Uh, he's an incredible musical ear, and he's just a complete asshole. You can't work with him. You know, he just cannot deal with human beings. He just treats everyone like dirt. And uh, so everyone has different qualities, some good, some bad, you know. And it's and, until you've worked with them, you don't know. That's the weird thing. And I think most people are like this when it comes to producers. Hmm. So the, the, the question of the, your next producer is also a, a blank slate then? Oh, totally. I mean, literally, we will work with anyone, and it's only in hindsight. It's only like you, when you've been through the marriage, you can see what that person was like. Because mm -hmm. uh, it's very much like that. You, you get thrust in a studio with somebody, all those errors on end. It's very intense, and there's tantrums and, and you know, creative sort of hurricanes going on, and we've got to get this born right, we've got to get this baby pulled out correctly, you know. This one's looks like it's not going to survive, let's kill it off. You know, there's a lot of real um, kind of deep-in-the-mud, stir-up creative stuff going on. You get very kind of intimate with these people, and uh, but it's only afterwards when you've finished, you say, well, okay, I know what kind of person this person is now. And uh, I wouldn't, uh, some I would work with again. I wouldn't work with Gus Dudgeon again. Um... I would work with John Leckie again. I might work with Hugh Padgham again. He was very good on engineering skills. Mm -hmm. So they're all different. It's it's a real how long is a, a piece of string question. Mm -hmm. you, you, you must get a lot of offers. I mean, every, everybody's sort of gone through their XTC period. Everybody sort of holds you up as the, the standard of excellence in pop, et cetera, et cetera. Don't you get a lot of uh, offers? Yeah, we do get a lot of offers, and, and some of them are from quite surprising quarters. You know, you get like... Um, Stephen Haig will be asking to produce you, and I think he's best known for the Pet Shop Boys. Mm -hmm. Or you'll get, um, you know, like Butch Vig of Nirvana or something might say, oh, yeah, I'd, I want to work with these fellas, you know. Mm -hmm. he did the, the only thing I think he's known for is Nirvana and those, those garbage records. Um, you know, the band garbage, not... <laughs> Uh, We're making a qualitative judgment there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I didn't mind Nirvana, actually. They they reminded me of Black Sabbath in a very unusual sort of way. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I don't know if anyone else has made that connection. I believe so. That that, that and Killing Joke. Killing Joke and Black Sabbath. Are yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, you, you, so you get offers and... Uh, you're not really inspired enough to, to say, okay, this this is the guy. I literally work with anyone. It, it's it's almost down to comes down to a name out of a hat in the end. Mm -hmm. um, because you're just you, there's no way of foretelling their personality. All you have to go on is past records of different bands or different artists, and there's no way you can distill someone's personality out of a bunch of records that he's been in the studio while they've been making those albums. Mm -hmm. That's that's no measure to hold up against someone to say, okay, I think I know what they're like to work with. Um, you don't know. It's, you, I think you always go in blind. Mm -hmm. And we've made some, some good judgments and some appalling ones, so I'm sure that'll, that'll be the uh, the pattern for the future. So, uh, some of the, uh, the, the Brit, so-called Brit-pop bands that have been scoring massive commercial success these days are, are compared at least partially to text you see do, 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 do people ever tell you this is the time you should be releasing a record this is your your big commercial break in the offing here you know this, uh, this no I, I, it, I mean practically some of those bands do sound like they they do plow or they are plowing for the first time territory that I think we've done in the past mm -hmm. Uh, which is fine for them because that's their new thing. They're discovering that for the first time or whatever. And I can see similarities, quite a lot of similarities in some case. But um, there's no way on earth that we could ever want to or try to or it would not be right for us to attempt to cash in because a lot of, of what 
uh, motivates the sales of those bands is their age and um, the connection with you know like I'd say I, th I think they're probably connecting with more kids between like 17 and 22 mm -hmm. say just two ages out of the air there and um, in a lot of countries, we probably connect with much older people, although strangely enough, um, I'm going to contradict myself there and say our biggest market is American college kids. Mm -hmm. For us, I mean... Exactly, that, and that's the way it's always been, right? Yeah, that's the way it's always been. We seem to find new, a new, young, continuous stream of American college kids for our music. I don't know why. I thought America would be the last bastion on earth that we would ever crack you know how do you make ripples in an enormous lake of treacle that is america how do you do it there's nothing big enough you can drop in that treacle to make a ripple and um but they seem to love us so i don't know what we're doing right um but it would not be right for us to attempt to uh, as you say kind of cash in on this um because it's you know we're middle-aged men and and we do what we do because it's now become a disease with us. You know, we're stuck on these kind of rails to hell. There's no way we can get off. I think if you're a young band and you and you, you make a couple of records and then you fall to pieces and go back to your day job, it may not be so uh, such a driving thing. You know, it may you may have dropped your force, if you see what I mean. But for us because we've been at it so long and I think we've actually got better albeit in the public eye we've got we've had to get better we've had to learn the sort of songwriting and record making craft in the open nowhere to hide um, I think we have got better and it, it, it is like this disease we're compelled to carry on we can't stop it's like the quest for the the perfect pop album or the perfect pop song or something it's, it's extremely shocking to hear that you, you've lost hearing in one of your ears well it's it regained after a while but it's it's there's a lot of um, a lot of the high ends are missing totally wow that's that's too bad i'm very sorry about that well it looks like me and brian wilson is yet uh, something else are having come on with the old nutcase <laughs> that's one way of looking at it i guess <laughs> would, would this have a decisive influence on your decision as to whether or not to tour again well i i did damage actually did damage the hearing um, in in both years, touring in any case. Oh, I see. Um, but the uh, the um, this infection in my right ear did uh, a lot more damage, uh, and and temporarily made me deaf for quite a while. Good lord! Uh, for a couple of months, which was very frightening because I thought, oh my god, you know, that's uh, not only <laughs> I go around with badges saying instead of back to mono, it's back to just one half of your stereo. You know, um, I, I'm not interested in touring, but I won't write it off because my personality, everyone's personality changes mm -hmm. a drip at a time, you know, a, a grain of sand at a time. And there may really come a time where I'm just gagging to do it again. But right now, I, I'm not interested and would, would much rather... Um, work on in the studio on on either xtc or anonymous projects mm -hmm. I, I do have a love of anonymous music you know music made by people you don't know who the hell they are that's that's a, a, a concept with which i'm not familiar right <laughs> who's making anonymous music now well i mean <clears throat> i it, it's it's an idea that we touched on briefly with the dukes of stratosphere oh, and I see. Okay. that was our cover was blown immediately. Yeah, that, that was not very anonymous. No, well, it wasn't our fault we were blown. We would have liked to have kept it anonymous. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I do have a love of anonymous, you know, authors who write books anonymously or, or people that make anonymous music, you know. You're, it, it's quite a thing. I, I, I think everyone's had the desire to do that kind of thing in the past. I think Zappa did the thing with Ruben and the Jets, although his cover was blown. The Beach Boys had Coral and the Passions, and uh, Roy Wood did Eddie and the Falcons. And, you know, all the bands you wanted to be in maybe when you were a kid. Um, but I also have this love of anonymous music. I have the, the desire to make records that maybe you buy in a sealed paper bag. You just you rip the paper bag open to get the record.